Okay, good evening, um, everyone. Um, I'm, I apologize for my voice. I've been struggling with a little bit of fever for the last uh, few days. Um, let me just start by thanking uh, the faculty, the staff, the students of Casa Italiana for making my teaching stint here uh, such a great time and a uh, wonderful experience. The few times in which my uh, brain automatically switches uh, to English, Casa Italiana immediately becomes Italian home. And this is obviously thanks to you all. <coughs> or maybe it's just my English, it's not that. <laughs> Uh, it's just bad, and I never got the difference between house and uh, and home. Um, anyway, I am a, um, a historian, and I have worked um, on Italy's nationality laws. And as uh, Ruth has uh, uh, so kindly reminded, um, and how they evolve under the uh, uh, influence of migration, both immigration and immigration. I did that since the unification of the state in 1861 to our current times. Um, international migration, citizenship policies, membership uh, regimes of both sending and host countries shift the lines between citizens and residents, nationals and foreigners. Um, in a book published in 2004, The uh, Rights of Others, uh, Seyla Ben Abib reflects upon the effects of globalization and international migration on the nation state system and the definition of the demos. As Ben Abib reminds us, quote, popular sovereignty is not identical with territorial sovereignty. Although the two are closely linked, both historically and normatively. Popular sovereignty means that all full members of the demos are entitled to have a voice in the articulation of the laws by which the demos is to govern itself. She also adds, there has never been a perfect overlap between the circle of those who stand under the law's authority and the full members of the demos. Every democratic demos has disenfranchised some, while recognizing only certain individuals as full members. Yet presence within a circumscribed territory, in particular continuing residence within it, brings one under the authority of the sovereign. The new politics of membership is about negotiating this complex relationship between the rights of full membership, democratic voice, and territorial residence. The often quoted phrase, the right to have rights, by Hannah Arendt, meaning both belonging to and being accepted by an organized political community powerfully defines citizenship and its function as gateway to full participation in the social, economic, cultural, and political life of a country. In this talk, I will share some consideration with you on Italy and the right of others. The others being mainly two categories perceived as essentially different from the native-born population, in that their social, cultural, even economic identities are described as internally homogeneous and immutable over time. I argue that both these labels used to describe respectively the emigrants and their descendants, the, those that I labeled here as the internal others or the new non-Italians, <coughs> and, the, um, and uh, uh, the emigrants and their descendants, so the external, the Italians abroad. Um, are biased with essentialism and even racialism um, and need to be problematized as well as the underpinning narratives and policies that are behind these labels. Classic theories of nationalism have helped explain how the construction of a mass citizenry has come into historical being as a matter of state action related to processes of modernization. Nationality and nationness uh, are described as cultural political artifacts that rely on the identification of significant others uh, in order to develop. In the state and nation building process, identitarian divisions and a weed day distinction are politically constructed through the drawing of borders between the self, which is the community of the officially recognized dominant culture, and the others, which are ethnic, cultural, sexual minorities, immigrants, immigrants, aliens. 
The main question that we analyze will concern the quality of democratic citizenship in Italy by looking at the access to citizenship rights or the attainment of political membership rights by the two categories that I have just described. Let's specify that all forms of national citizenship have both an inclusionary and exclusionary phase. You saw that you sanguinous citizenship constitute the two principal ways in which people gain citizenship. And Aharent identifies a civic ideal of polity the wine where access to citizenship is based mainly on your soil, as opposed to an ethnic quality, where access to citizenship is regulated by the sand. In this uh, chart here, you can see uh, a map um, that describes the, uh, the different ways in which you soil is uh, adopted and implemented or not adopted in, uh, in Europe. Um, it's uh, use solely is present in um, as a general principle in uh, uh, 19 states. Um, it's uh, considered um, well. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this in a in a second. Um, as Christian Jocke, political scientist, um, uh, has correctly underlined, rather than reflecting particular visions of nationhood. You soli and you sanguinis are flexible legal technical mechanisms uh, that allow multiple interpretations and combinations. As a matter of fact, states, uh, the legislation of, on citizenship by most states is a combination of you citizenship and you soli, and Italy is not an exception. Um, but Iseo Donohan is also right in observing that. This may be true that, 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 that you saw in your sanguinis are technical mechanisms, but citizenship laws constitute a legal norm that shapes the reality of citizenship. Those you saw came over time to represent the openness and accessibility of citizenship. So you saw citizenship has, in practice, the advantage of offering membership of a given political community to those most likely to live there, to the subject, to, to those who are subject to its laws and to con and, and, and contribute to its society and the economy. Um, as you can see here, Italy is ranked uh, by the uh, Observatory, European Democracy Observatory on Citizenship, as a country of weak youth solely. Um, these are the uh, main ways uh, um, in which foreign nationals uh, or foreign-born uh, can uh, access Italian nationality. Um, you have the ordinary naturalization according to the current law, that is the law that was approved uh, in 1992, uh, February 1992. There's uh, ordinary naturalization that is by residence, and you have the, uh, the, the, the number of years, the requirements uh, specified there. For non-EU immigrants, um, it's 10 years. Um, it's the uh, currently it's the highest in uh, in uh, the European Union. Um, on top of that, the application, uh, the procedure that uh, the uh, applicant must follow is discretionary. So the fact that uh, the it's not only the the years required of residence continues and uh, uh, legal residence in the country, but it's also the fact that the procedure is discretionary, so it's not automatic or by declaration. By marriage, you have the specified the, uh, the requirements, and Italy uh, envisages um, an access to, nationalities, to nationality to citizenship by youth solely, not at birth, but uh, when uh, within one year after coming of age uh, and provide proving that the presence in the country, the residence in the country has been uninterrupted for the whole 18 years since year zero to year 18 and uh, always as a documented regular immigrant. This of course uh, projects the responsibility of the status uh, onto the parents of the uh, of the uh, um, of 
the kid of the children uh, born in, uh, in Italy by uh, immigrant parents. The procedure is kind of harsh because uh, there's just one year window of opportunity between the, 18, uh, uh, the coming of age, so when uh, uh, the applicant uh, becomes 18 and when um, between 18 and 19. And it's, it's done by declaration. And then we have provisions that are uh, that are interesting the descendants of the Italian immigrants who are born abroad and uh, the, the so-called external citizenship and it's based on the principle of uh, your sanguinis and the only uh, requirement that the descendants of immigrants abroad have to uh, demonstrate to show is that the significant ancestor, the person who uh, migrated from Italy, never renounced uh, citizenship in front of the Italian authorities voluntarily. Uh, there is no generational limit. There is no requirement to have a previous or future residence in Italy. There are no uh, uh, integration, civic language requirements as, uh, in the form of tests of, uh, of any sort. Um, let's focus first on the external address. As you can see, the, uh, as I showed before, the, the size of the two population are, are, very, are very similar, it's striking. So, according to the latest data of the uh, uh, registry of the Italians residing abroad, Aire, um, Italians abroad are 4,450,000, more or less. The percentage on the total population, the Italian population, is 7.45, 49. Uh, here is the, uh, um, the distribution in uh, terms of geographical residence of the Italians, uh, the Italians abroad. Um, as you can see, most of them are residing in Europe. Uh, so 35, uh, this is 52, is that right? And then you have 34% in South America, 9% in Central North America, and 5% is in Asia, Africa, and Oceania. Um, from 1861 to 1990, um, almost uh, 29 million people left Italy, 60% of which between 1880 and 1930. And the main countries to which Italians emigrated applied the youth solid birth. You can see here the, um, the main, the main uh, countries uh, Italian mass migration was directed to. Um, the main countries, I, I would say, to which Italians emigrated applied the youth solid birth. And policies also of quick and easy naturalization by residents, often um, even in uh, compulsory terms, as in the case of Argentina and Brazil at the end of the 19th century, when their main political and strategic need was condensing the motto governare es poblar by Juan Bautista Alberti. That is getting control uh, over the territory by populating it and most of all widening it. Uh, as Italian legislation on citizenship was based on the transmission of nationality by descent, even back then, this conflict between citizenship regimes created a permanent state of potential tension with subsequent conflicts, open conflicts between the states with regard to military service and taxation. Uh, yet since the, uh, already since the 19th century, Italy has been viewing her nationals abroad and, and their descendants as a population demographic uh, capital not to be wasted. So expatriates have been considered um, from time to time an economic resource, um, mainly their remittances were what the Italian state was after. Uh, a political resource, a possible lobby, political lobby to activate on behalf of the Italian interests in the international scenario. A manpower resource, that is, uh, try to draw back the descendants of uh, the emigrants uh, the um, 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 as a possible um, better, most, well, possible substitute of the spontaneous immigrants that were entering in Italy 
and in a way selecting uh, ethnically the kind of immigration that was um, um, coming to Italy. Um, this is not new, what the Italian state did, like many other countries of immigration in the past and in the present times, um, has, been, has been pursued by, uh, by many countries, as I say. Um, the fact is that, according to the Italian law, both the 1912 nationality law and the reform of that law, the 1992 nationality law, which is the law currently in force. As I said before, it, um, it became almost impossible to lose Italian nationality unless, uh, as, a, um, unless um, um, as a voluntary act of renunciation in front of Italian authorities. So basically what Italy decided to do was to maintain this sort of uh, Italian nationality by descent at, at a latent state, so that um, um, this citizenship uh, maintained at this latent state would grant the state, the Italian state, the right to intervene and assert its sovereignty in protection of the expatriates, opportunity turned into Italians abroad when it was functional to collective and national interest in the international scenario. Um, because of these path-dependent policies, Italy is today one of the most generous countries in the European Union, at least, to offer citizenship by descent. Uh, as I said before, in order to claim Italian origins and turn it into a citizenship, a passport, it is sufficient to prove that the Italian male ancestor, also female if born after 1948, never renounced Italian nationality in front of the Italian authorities. Uh, the procedure is automatic. Uh, can be carried out at consulates abroad or at a municipality in Italy. Uh, once the individual has his or, his or her national uh, citizenship, Italian citizenship reactivated, recognized, the same documentation can be used by other members of the same family in a speed track procedure. Between 1998 and 2001, there's a mistake there, it's 2001, more than a million people, one million uh, 3,403 people made use of the opportunity um, and turned um, their, their Italian latent uh, nationality citizenship into a passport. Um, most of the new passports, as you see here by uh, Yusanguinis, 73.3% uh, were released in Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, mainly following serious economic crises that struck those countries in 2001 and 2002. These data are underestimating the actual number of newly recognized Italian. Um, because, of course, um, uh, when, they, when the, uh, the, the applicants follow the procedure in Italy, they cannot be tra traced. So they are not detected by, uh, by, the, by, the, um, by, the, uh, by the by the administration. Because when they enter Italy, they get a special uh, status, a special permit, which is a citizenship. It's a sort of a citizen on weight of recognition. And once they get the Italian citizenship recognized, it's just, you cannot distinguish uh, this descendants of immigrants from, for example, me, who, uh, I mean, I have lived in England and in the Netherlands. If I go back to Italy and then move my residency back to Italy, I'm just an Italian from abroad moving his, his residency back to Italy. And uh, the procedure cannot distinguish between the two groups. So there is an unknown number of people detaining this Italian spread nationality throughout the world. There are various estimations by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Catholic Church Fundazione Migrantes, and they suggest that there might be as many as 60 million to 80 million people of Italian ancestry living in the world. Uh, 25 million in Brazil, 20 in Argentina, 17.8 in the United States. <coughs> you can reasonably assume that at least half of them are able to meet the very loose requirements needed to breathe life into their spare nationality, Italian nationality. Many applicants um, do not wish to migrate to Italy or even Europe. As pointed out by Alejandro Portes, migrants have learned how to use these transnational opportunities as a way to get around um, 
national regulatory obstacles to their social economic mobility. Um, basically, descendants of former uh, immigrants look at this uh, uh, as an opportunity to get a European passport, uh, which means they are entitled to freedom of establishment and work within the EU territory. They use it to, uh, uh, to get work opportunities, social pensions, special assistance programs and subsidies. Uh, they may even enter the United States under the visa waiver program where they can explore the informal labor market, relying on the extensive Latin, uh, Latin American community, for example. So, especially in South America, this, this Italian citizenship um, has become a sort of life insurance policy. If you look at the economic cycles of Argentina, for example, Uruguay to some extent, Brazil to a lesser extent, Brazil to a lesser extent, but the cycle uh, every 10 years goes like booming of the economy, inflation and crisis, booming of the economy, inflation and crisis. So um, as, the, as the, the people I interviewed in Argentina told me, they get the Italian passport and they don't move. Uh, and the main reason is, por las dudas, you never know. And it is a citizenship you, you may use it. You may use to to have access also if you don't move uh, to free to to healthcare uh, pr special programs at private hospitals that are subsidized by the Italian state. This is actually an unforeseen bur burden to Italy's and other EU countries' welfare system and public budget, which is destined to grow in the next year. There is a risk that this overextension of sovereignty, as pointed out by Mira Waterbury, might lead to a, a domestic political contestation and a backlash against the redefinition of the uh, political community to include those outside the state border. Um, Here you see the share of the um, descendants, and now we are uh, starting to get a different picture of the figure I gave at the beginning of the talk about the external others. So if we looked at the data of the IRA, um, uh, only five years ago, the Italians abroad, more than five years ago, six years ago, the Italians abroad were a little bit uh, more than three million. So we cannot assume that even though there, there are some flows, outflows from Italy today, some significant, relatively significant outflows of people from Italy even today, uh, we cannot assume that people are migrating today as uh, at the turn of the um, 19th and 20th century by uh, the hundred thousands per year. Um, so this increase, this leap in the presence of the Italians abroad is explain mainly uh, with the, the share of the descendants of the people who reactivated Italian citizenship abroad and didn't move, so who got an Italian passport abroad. And they can be estimated around a 22.5 percent, a point more, a bit less, probably more than uh, of the total. Um, Of course, Italians abroad have um, asked for political voice, inclusion and representation uh, since the, uh, the end of the, the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Um, it was only with the um, Constitution, the Republican Constitution of 1948 that uh, voting rights were recognized uh, to Italians living abroad provided that they returned to Italy to cast their ballots. Of course, this made it very difficult, especially for Italian nationals living in the Americas or Australia, for example, to, to uh, exercise their political uh, rights. But Italy built uh, forms of political representation and spaces of political representation. For Italians abroad, already started in the 70s with representative bodies dedicated representative bodies in the region, then with the committees in 1885, the committees are these committees of Italians abroad were established in 1895 and it's the first institutional body 
representing Italians um, residing abroad and after uh, a meeting of the Italians abroad in Rome uh, held in 1988, uh, another piece of uh, this um, uh, progressive institutionalization uh, of the representation of, of the Italians abroad was added with the General Council of Italians Abroad, CGA, uh, which is um, providing an unmediated linkage with Italy and its institutions. The climax of these uh, political inclusions were, of the expatriates was uh, reached with the approval of the constitutional laws um, of the, uh, in, in the year 2000 and um, the law of um, uh, December 2001. Uh, and according to this legislation, Italian residents abroad now can vote uh, um, by mail uh, from uh, their country of uh, actual current residence without uh, going back to Italy. And uh, they elect their own uh, representatives in the parliament. They have uh, the so-called discrete uh, districts or uh, dedicated seats. They can elect six senators and 12 deputies in representation of four geographic constituencies. Europe, South America, North America, North and Central America, and Asia, Africa, Oceania. Um, the, incidentally, the electoral regulations are such that all the Italians by descent, so all the Italians who get their Italian citizenship recognized as descendants of former immigrants, um, are automatically enrolled in the electoral list when they get their passport. Uh, while, uh, and, and of course they have their electoral cards and ballots shipped directly to their abode. While Italians temporarily or uh, um, even um, not so temporarily uh, residing or traveling abroad cannot cast their ballots as easily because in order to vote they have to register at the consulate by the end of the year preceding the elections and provide a permanent address. Let's switch the perspective and look, let's look at the other uh, others, <laughs> the internal others, the immigrants. Um, the presence of foreign nationals in Italy between 1861 and 73 was almost negligible. Uh, just to mention some data, in 1911 census, um, 80, 81,000 foreigners were, list, were listed uh, on a population of almost 36 million. 1921 census was 110. Um, but still, uh, the concern about um, who could have, get, uh, could have had access to Italian nationality um, was um, um, was revealing, and this is a quotation from the parliamentary debates um, um, that um, that uh, took place during the discussion of the nationality law of 1912. And uh, I'm not going to read the uh, the quotation in Italian, but uh, basically the core meaning of it is how come we cannot choose the people that are going to have access to Italian nationality? Because if, we, if we're going to set some, some rules that are valid for anybody just based on their residence in the country, we're going to end up with uh, people from Albania uh, and not maybe uh, the Brits and, uh, or the Germans. So let's look at the internal others. Um, According to the Italian census of 2011, there are 4,570,000 um, foreigners uh, living in Italy. 7.% um, of the total population. The minors are almost a million. So again, it's uh, kind of striking the, the, parallel, uh, the parallelism within the two Population. It's uh, the amount, so the descendants here amount for more or less 22 per 22% of the total. Born in Italy, second generation, it's an estimate by Caritas are 650. That means that uh, at least 300 and something are the so called generation 1.5, one and a half. So basically, they enter the country um, 
as, um, as minors, uh, together with their parents. Um, since the 70s and the mid 80s, most of the immigrants settled in the country working in the informal economy. Uh, so here you have uh, a, um, a table that shows you how Italy caught up very uh, quickly um, with, the, uh, with countries of, uh, of longer tradition of immigration, like France, uh, Belgium, um, the Netherlands, um, and, uh, <coughs> and even Germany, um, of course. Um, the leaps in the presence of foreign residents, though, are probably less dependent on actual inflows than regularizations. So Italy has carried out five regularization processes between 18, 1986 and 2002. And uh, uh, Italy regularized, regularized 1.4 million migrants in this, uh, in this um, period. In most cases, though, people who were already irregularly living, uh, working and living and having children in, uh, in the country are listed as immigrant residents in the statistics and by the authorities with a significant delay with respect to their actual entry into the country. This has obviously an impact on their route to residence-based citizenship. The largest um, national group are the Romanians, representing 21.2% of the total foreign residents, followed by Albanians, Moroccans, Chinese, and you can read the rest of the, of the nationalities. Uh, the presence of immigrants has become more and more characterized as sedentary and permanent in Italy, as confirmed by several indicators, equal shares of men and women, the prevalence of married people on single persons, house ownership, the increase of immigrant children born in Italy. Um, here you see um, the, the um, increase of the presence of the minors, foreign minors, in Italy from 2001 to 2010. It's quite impressive. Um, here you have the... By the way, this, this presence of the immigrants, uh, and especially the younger generations of immigrants in Italy, is very much needed uh, in a country that is uh, uh, um, aging and uh, is struggling with uh, uh, a very low uh, birth rate, uh, and has been struggling with a very low birth rate for the last uh, decades. Various agencies um, have calculated, and research institutes have calculated that immigrants in Italy produce between 9 and 11 percent of the GDP. Um, this slide uh, shows the evolution of the acquisition of citizenship by marriage and ordinary naturalization summed together between 2002 and 2010. There is a clear growing trend towards a constant increase. Um, but if, if we look at the different nationalities, Romanians are the, main, the first uh, group of immigrants present in Italy but it's Moroccans and Albanians, the first national groups for ordinary naturalization. This is clearly the result of the fact that the four Romanians being EU citizens, the advantages, there's not an urgent need to naturalize uh, in Italy. Um, they don't have a pressing need to apply for Italian citizenship. We just basically had the right to vote for uh, the national elections in Italy, but as for the rest, um, nothing will change. It changes for Moroccans and Albanians and other nationalities, so non-EU immigrant, uh, immigrant population. And um, so together with the Tunisians, these three groups are the most represented nationalities in uh, acquisition of citizenship. But they also the first, uh, the, the most represented nationalities in the first waves of immigration to the country uh, from the 1980s on. Um, Yet the number of people who naturalize in Italy each year, even if it has increased since 2004, it remains quite low if compared to other countries of immigration in the EU. Um, an estimation of the NGO Save the Children based on ISTA data reckoned that in 2009, 
the non-EU foreign residents eligible to apply for ordinary naturalization in Italy were 726,000. And here you have the number of people who got Italian citizenship, that here it's uh, more or less 60,000. It's impossible, well, it's quite difficult to come up with figures of relating, concerning the naturalizations of the so-called second generation. So, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the infamous generation that has to prove uninterrupted residence from, the, from year zero to year 18, and apply for and apply for citizenship when they turn when they come of age, um, because um, oddly enough they are not considered full citizens um, during this whole period, but when they apply they are. So they are not listed or considered statistically speaking uh, uh, any different from uh, the other the other kids who get their. Uh, um, their, um, um, their identity cards or their residency procedure um, uh, administered by the, by the local municipalities. So there's a, now there's a, um, there's a pilot study by, promoted by the Association of the Municipalities in Italy and they uh, monitored uh, 12 cities, if I'm not uh, wrong, 11 or 12 cities um, and they came up with the first data about um, these applications and it, come, it, it emerges that um, the share of uh, successful applications um, on the uh, total of the eligible uh, population is around 60 percent. So Italy is, is uh, basically rejecting at least a 40 percent of uh, basically, Italian citizens. Um, here is the question of political inclusion and representation for the uh, uh, foreigners, for the new non Italians uh, residing in the country. Uh, there has been many attempts, um, starting from the Stras Strasbourg Convention of 1992 that Italy ratified in 1994, the Convention on the Participation of Foreigners in Public Life at Local Level. Italy ratified it, but quite quickly in 1994, but with the exception of Chapter C, which is the right to vote in local authority elections, considered because they, the Italian Parliament considered that in conflict with the with Article 48 of the Constitution, that it says that citizens uh, have the right to vote. Uh, you can have, you see many attempts there, um, and they were not were all unsuccessful. The last one is this campaign that has been promoted by NGOs like Rete G2, G, G, G2 I was mixing it in English, Rete, uh, which is uh, the second generation network, G2. Um, the National Associations, again, of Italian Municipalities, ANCI. Um, other subjects are involved, like the Catholic uh, Church, Caritas, the left-wing ARCI. Um, and they have been campaigning for uh, reform of the legislation on citizenship more liberal terms to grant immigrants the right to vote in local elections and um, reform the USOLI provisions, the USOLI uh, measures in more <coughs> liberal terms. Um, that is basically granting full citizenship uh, status to children after when they enter basically the um, ciclo scolastico, that is when they enter uh, the school, when they, when they start going to school when they are um, six, six years old provided that the, the parents have uh, been living in the country uh, for five years or six years. So th there are different um, uh, proposals, but mainly the, the, um, it's the civil society that is trying to change um, the, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this situation, the condition of the, of the immigrants and, and their access to political rights and citizenship. Here you have um, a table that, in a way, um, synthesizes the uh, electoral rights. The first group is the Italians, um, and um, 
so it's not even me, it's the, an Italian resident in Italy. Okay? Then we have the Italian abroad, which is me, and then we have the new non-Italian with the dis distinction between uh, the, those who are EU members, uh, EU um, citizens, and those who are. Is there a question? Okay. So you can see, well, it's the, the, uh, the visual impact, I think, uh, need no further explanation, okay? Um, here we have, again, um, a comparison between the two groups. And I, well, I played a little bit here uh, with, the, with uh, a motto we should appeal uh, uh, to you know, some <laughs> and Americans, if there are any in the audience. Uh, so the, the internal, uh, I define the political rights of the internal others as a taxation without representation. And the uh, political rights of the external others as no taxation and maybe over representation. So the legislation on external voting, the main criticism to the current legislation on external voting, um, revolve around the issue that the voting procedure by mail is not guaranteed as personal, equal, free and secret as stated by Article 48 of the Constitution. But this is not the main, the main, in my opinion, the main, the main problem. In truth, a solution to this problem should not be too difficult to, to find, considering the fact that other nations adopt postal voting, even e-voting or voting by proxy, with fewer problems. Um, Italian legislation appears to be conceived and not very well thought through because of its interaction with Italy's citizenship policies. So the share of the uh, people from the second generation on, onward who, are, who have no uh, genuine link with the polity, with the interest, uh, the political interest of the uh, country uh, is, is destined to grow and is destined to wait more and more uh, with the passing of time. Um, and this is creating, of course, this is raising a lot of normative and pragmatic uh, questions. Um, the, the legislation on external voting was meant to give the Italians abroad a symbolic representation in the parliament um, with a fixed ratio of 1 p.m. elected abroad every 52.5 uh, p.m. elected in Italy, in both the Chamber of Deputies and Senate. Yet, under many respects, the 2001 law grants broader right to external voters than to electors in Italy. The table here shows how Italy's external voting provisions represent a peculiar case of maybe a fir affirmative redistricting in favor of external citizens. Because if we focus our attention on the last column, that's the average uh, voter per uh, district, you see that the voters abroad are actually fewer than the voters uh, in Italy. So, um, that might be a problem. <laughs> um, but I'm more interested in um, other aspects, that is if the democratic uh, legitimacy, the, if, if this legislation has widened the participation and representation of subject, subjects that were previously excluded, so in the book that um, I've just edited in Italian, Il Voto degli Altri, um, and it was published this year, in 2012, um, the, each chapter is analyzing the, um, the processes of representation in, in each of the four constituencies. Um, in another work that I've published in English in 2011, I've um, analyzed the case of um, Latin America, South America. And, um, it's quite evident, both from my work and the work of my um, uh, colleagues, the colleagues that participated in my edited book, it's quite um, evident that Italy's legislation on external voting has raised some of the extant consolidated processes of representation, structures, and logic of power related to the network of associations, local ethnic elites, to a different metropolitan level. But it's more or less the same uh, 
political uh, process, the same um, representative of um, and the same logic of representation that were in place already in the 70s and the 80s, so for the CGA, for the committees, and so on. Um, if anything, uh, what the legislation uh, on external voting um, did, uh, it was to increase the visibility of these uh, political elites, not their capacity of representing the population abroad, very doubtfully their power and possibilities to effectively intervene in, in both political arenas. Uh, the emigrants appear to have little capacity to influence the policies towards them, as well as to challenge the extant structures of power. This expanding enfranchisement of people who have weak effective links or no genuine links with the country of origin of their ancestors, as I say, poses very, very uh, important normative problems. The main traits of the Italian democracy are a, very are a very difficult access to citizenship and political rights to individuals who are not born in the country and do not have historical or blood ties with the, with the nation. Access to citizenship and political rights is extremely gener generous towards the born abroad descendants of former immigrants who are perceived as members of a larger national community and that transcends the, uh, ter the territory of the state and constitutes a sort of a constructed form of colonial relationship between the mother country and the nephew of the, of the immigrants. This talk on citizenship policies of Italy with their over-inclusive approach towards the descendants of the expatriates, their probably over-exclusive stance towards the immigrants residing in the national territory, territory and their descendants, I think contributes significantly to the normative debate on the rights of others. Uh, it is evident here that the principles of equality and inclusion are applied with large generosity towards the expatriates and their descendants, while the principles of affected interest, stakeholder citizenship, subject unto the law, and to the political consequences of the decisions that, that voters authorize uh, through their vote are left out of the framework. More importantly, the Italian case displays an alarming degree of conflation um, of the demos into the ethnos. I now wear my main hat, that is the historians. And history discloses that the quality of democracy in states which exclude the others along ethnic lines is not only low, but dangerously open to, again with Anaharen's words, the transformation of the state from an instrument of the law into an instrument of the nation. Thanks. Uh, democracy, 
because on the one hand, uh, this word uh, implies and describes a form of government and thus a specific territorial organization uh, upon which uh, this uh, legal order is imposed. But on the other hand, it is a, a principle of uh, equal uh, opportunity and consideration of individuals, even in participation in, 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 in forms not directly necessarily and not necessarily formally. Uh, formal participation, even the uh, participation to uh, opinion and thus through influence, indirect influence is a form of uh, internal to the conception of democracy. And as you, as we know, we can uh, uh, influence uh, a process uh, procedurally defined also through free, free law speech. We don't need it even to have a kind of uh, um, formalized citizenship in order to express or to influence. So for this reason, why this attention or this insistence to give votes to uh, like, uh, like um, immigrants, Italian immigrants who uh, live abroad, whether, whereas we know that can, in, that can influence the process in different ways. No? What is the, the, the urgency of giving them the right to vote? Now, if we remember when this happened, that is in 2000, right? Uh, the, 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 well, there was a kind of political interest in, in that. It was not so uh, based on this normative generosity or normative purity of, of the theory of democracy or whatever else theory. The, um, those, uh, um, the, uh, the, the name of uh, the proponent of this law uh, from a fascist organization, fascist party, uh, tra, um, tra, Tramaglio, was the, Tramaglio was, the, was the name, uh, he had a project, like his party had a project after the collapse of the, of the traditional parties after 1994, the idea was to, knowing uh, with statistics and personal relationship with organizations outside of Italy, he knew very well, like uh, all the right wing parties knew, that this would be for them possible to reach, uh, to have a strong, larger majority by giving the, the right to vote to the, to, the, to the Italians abroad. Since many Italians abroad, as we know, by relating to associations, uh, mutual association of support and form of uh, patronage of any kind, where in some, and also because of the tradition with the old the imperial um, crowd of being Italian under the fascist regime, for, regime, for many, uh, 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 Tramaglia thought, uh, uh, still uh, the attached to it, attachment to Italy was an attachment to an ideology. So that was one of the reasons why they, 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 they gave the right to vote to everybody. Uh, then perhaps uh, they, they made also a wrong calculation, because as we know, one of the governments, I don't remember which one, but the, the, the government Prodi, uh, the, the, the last government no, Prodi was exactly uh, elected um, or received a small, tiny uh, majority thanks to the foreign um, circoscrizione. Uh, like now, what I would like to, uh, to, uh, to say, and like to give the, the right to, uh, to everybody to talk um, and to ask questions to, um, to, uh, to, my, to Guido is the following. I think that this right to vote, and I mobilized personally, along with Sartori and other people, to repeal this law and to change this law, because it is unjust for those who live like uh, you and me, the first uh, Italians who live abroad, this law makes uh, the right to vote more complicated not easier, more difficult. Because suppose that you are not, because it locks you inside of your residency. You cannot move from your residency. If you want to go to Italy or you, by, by any chance you find yourself in Italy, you could not vote. So I am an Italian citizen, that I, I am a completely Italian citizen, I also residence to Italian uh, residency de facto, but every time I have to vote, I don't know why, for many other reasons I'm not here, so I've been disenfranchised since there is this new law, because I, I cannot vote. It's true that there is a, the law that tells you you have to apply before the end of the, uh, the year, that is within the January, December the 31st, if you want to uh, vote in your country, that is in Italy, you have to apply for it. But many times, you know, in Italy, elections come by accident or, you know, by chance. <laughs> uh, 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 they are not regular elections that you can anticipate in advance what you what they, they are going to do. And so sometimes this is the, the very uh, incredible thing that you are forced to, 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 to stay always here uh, if you want to vote. And it's so diffi difficult to, uh, to vote. The other issue that is very complicated is, uh, is, um, 
if the issue of, and, and this is an issue of equality because uh, the Italian citizens living in Italy and the Italian citizens living abroad, they have different accessibility to the right to vote. So uh, this is a breach of equality in the conditions for the right to vote. That is uh, very problematic. Indeed, uh, Gian, Gian Giacomo Migone, uh, who was a senator in the parliament when this law was passed, one of the few voting against because this law was passed with 90% almost unanimous in the parliament with this kind of all of nationalism, uh, you know, and he was one of the few to be against, and he was considered to be a kind of betrayal of the national identity, whatever. So we um, we should try to uh, collect signatures and to uh, to uh, to petition to change this uh, um, shameful law because it's shameful. Not only because it disassociates um, uh, representation from uh, um, taxation and from residence in the country, but makes also more difficult for the immigrants who are in Italy to have uh, rights because it bases Italian citizenship or citizenship, strictly speaking, the right to vote to uh, you know uh, to ethnos, as you said. So also because citizenship is not simply the right to vote. Citizenship is a constellation of rights. And you can think of disassociating the right to citizenship to, from the right to vote. And there are countries like England, and I, 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 I hope I'm not mistaken here. I went through the web to, to verify and call friends from England. And so if you leave the country, or if you leave, uh, or if you reside, here there is, uh, 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 okay. If you reside outside of your country for many years, five, six, do you have still the right to vote? No, not sure. Exactly. <laughs> that, no, you don't. But you can resume it, you can resume it yeah. if you go back. So the right to vote is something that you can drop and take in relation to the stability of your residence. This is civilization. This is civilized because it comes with me the right to vote. It doesn't stay with my family, blood, name, and so It comes with me person. Wherever I go, it comes or, or, or stops coming. So it, it, it's very, very relevant, this one. It's not simply the, you know, the kind of normativity in an abstract term. It's precisely the justice on the person that we, we uh, miss sometimes when we talk about. And finally, uh, uh, just to finish, you know, the, the, to finish the present, this presentation, um, concerning the immigrants, those who live in our country, which are the mirror-like image of what we are outside as immigrants, because the more we have rights, the less they do have rights. But this is not because of a, 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 a case of a chance. They too are related because they depend uh, from the way in which citizenship is uh, read, of course, is considered. So this doesn't make any kind of surprise to me that there is this uh, asymmetry of one and the other one. And the other things that needs to be paid attention to the, this question of the immigrants inside, I don't think, and this is the reason why I was in doubt before, and that is my question to you. I don't think that immigrants, even if they are in Italy, residing there for um, many years, they pay taxes and they don't ask for citizenship or are not yet citizens, uh, I don't think they can vote for local election. Exactly. So I was, it's true, uh, it was not like that, right? No, exactly. So because the, the Italian constitution and the Italian uh, constitutional court uh, disclaim the possibility of uh, disassociating the right for local election from the political rights. And this makes some sense uh, from the point of view of a legal um, conception. It's not completely absurd. But um, it would be good, uh, important, that all Europe adopted this system. Because uh, in Europe itself, the problem of uh, disassociating the local right election, meaning administration, city, uh, the, the city, the neighbor, whatever, and the political is a problem. Because they really don't want to have immigrants to be so included in the demos. The Europeans are not generous either. It's not simply, it's, it's really a problem of our continent, which is 
very close and with strong gates, even if, even if some countries seem to be more elastic. But this is not the case. And the question of the disassociation between the um, uh, administrative voting and political voting is an example. Now, I'll just conclude, and then we discuss. In the old Roman Empire, there was um, a kind of uh, layers of citizenship and layers of rights. So that for people living uh, very far away in Spain, and you know, they had to go to Rome to vote because they didn't have representations, uh, they used to have full rights of citizenship, uh, meaning uh, right today we would say, you know, fair trial, uh, basic rights of like persona juridica, without the need to have the right to vote. So, key was sine suffragio. Mm -hmm. Which means that it's possible to have different layers of citizens. We don't like that. We don't like it not because of a question of taste, because it is in contradiction with the notion of sovereignty, which is radically unitarian, radically absolute, and doesn't allow different layers of belonging. That is the problem. So it's not simply the question of citizenship. It is a question of that citizenship in modern times after the 17th century on has been engrafted within a conception or a practice of sovereignty that is strongly uh, monopolitical one and uh, absolute uh, so that it treats all the subjects in the same way and includes them in the same way of course you understand this was a great achievement because the opposite was to have intermediary like uh, classes, caste, you know, the ancien regime. So if you want to have all citizens equally, um, you have to give them the same kinds of inclusion. Yet today, in relation particularly to those who are immigrants in, wait in the waiting room for citizenship, not forever, in the waiting room, we should think of recognizing them some forms of local participations, which is more than simply, uh, you know, being part of the school with the children and the local um, uh, other kinds of activities, but also be part of, because the federalization of Europe, of states, it makes local very powerful. The local power is very powerful today in distributing um, services, in distributing duties and obligations. So we need to think in terms of, uh, without, of course, in creating second row citizenship, those who vote for the local and those who vote for both the local and the national, because this we don't want that, but we should think in terms of preparation for national citizenship through this kind of intended stage for inclusion. So I stop here and then uh, uh, we discuss the that. both you, I don't mind who answers, but it, it does seem to me that the EU has begun to unlink uh, nationality from citizenship. Uh, there's a degree of mobility, obviously, in the labour market, access to things like healthcare and yeah. whatever, but also, obviously, access to voting in local elections. It seems to have begun to kind of uncouple belonging to a nation to having citizen rights. So why, why can that be, not be extended to extra family? family? What's, I mean, what I can see the ideological and political reasons, but is there any kind of juridical reason why you simply can't say um, citizenship doesn't necessarily have to reside in the nation state anymore? It can be people can acquire citizen rights through mobility and residence. Yeah, because the process of um, 
the process of uh, EU integration has made very clear that there are some limits. And one of these is the sovereignty of the single <coughs> member states when it comes to deciding their own nationality laws, or who is a member of the nation. And this is very much touching our own health. This, you know, the question I just raised. Uh, who has access to the polity is one of the, is maybe the quintessential trait or feature of the nation state. And uh, probably this is the best answer I can think of. Yeah, there is also the, the idea of uh, um, disincentivization, so to take away the incentive to immigrants to go to Europe, because if they know, uh, that, that's the argument, they can have, uh, you know, hospital, blah, blah. of course there is a kind of uh, flow uh, and, uh, of immigration, so th there are reasons of uh, uh, incentive or, or, or um, kind of this kind of argument, because otherwise, Technically speaking, it is very hard to justify because the European Union, particularly after the Lisbon Treaty, they had the notion of, uh, a notion of, of European definition of the citizen that uh, may be considered also to be possible, open, a possibility for disassociating from, from local to this national, uh, so that uh, Senegalese uh, can become an European citizen without passing through in theory, this would be possible if you read the, the Lisbon Treaty. They, in fact, many several countries, they didn't uh, sign that, or they didn't uh, allow for that, but that could be. That's, that's a dream of the Scots, for example, mm -hmm. right? Of being like a European. Yeah. Yeah. I just wondered um, uh, if you could tell us something about why this has occurred. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking as a historian, and the historian me the whole way through was thinking, why? Um, and, uh, and in particular, not just why, but whether this why can tell us something else, um, which is perhaps about Italian concepts of not just citizenship, but national identity, what it actually is to be Italian, uh, and how that's evolved over time. Because you did. You, I mean, I understood uh, Nadia's point that some of this has come about by very short-term electoral manoeuvring and political manoeuvring. That's obviously very interesting. But in your lecture, you were also you made constant references to you know uh, 1911, 1912. You say you go back to 1861. So you obviously have some idea of, of there being there being some historical roots of all of this. But but I'd like to know what you think they are. Well, basically. It's what uh, Donald Abacha uh, condensed in the phrase diaspora nationalism, and the combination of that and what another American scholar, Mark Chowati, I hope I pronounce his name, is, is that correct? Chowati. Chowati, it's so difficult for me to remember how, okay. Chowati, okay. Um, uh, condensed in the, uh, in the phrase emigrant colon colonialism. So basically, what I added to this two wonderful uh, <coughs> um, work, um, um, books um, was that I focus mainly on the, uh, on the uh, nationality laws, on the fact that citizenship was the, at the same time, the tool and the precondition for those two um, activities, political activities and plans and strategies to be enforced, to be implemented. So by reading the, um, all the parliamentary acts, it's uh, quite evident that since already from 1900, when the first immigration law is discussed, and uh, it's then approved in 1901, there's clearly, uh, evidently, a plan to transform from the top down uh, the immigration into um, a colonialist uh, um, act. So basically, there's, a, there's the uh, acknowledgement, the recognition, uh, quite, quite blunt by Italian politicians that Italy cannot participate in the uh, colonialist bonanza that's going on at the end of the 18th, uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th by means of the arms or with economic uh, um, 
um, with their economic strengths. So the idea is to found this free, they call them free colonies. It's a sort of spontaneous force of expansion, I'm almost quoting by heart, uh, that the, our population indicates to us. This is something that was very present in the, during the debates. I'd just like to say one very small thing to that. I mean, in order to actually test whether that is actually, I mean, I know the work and, and whether actually this is, in fact, the explanation, it might be very interesting to also actually have a comparative element and to look, for example, what, about the Irish experience, the other great emigrant nation, and to see whether that is the reason. That might be interesting. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, what I'm uh, probably going to work on now is exactly that, so that to add more comparative perspective on this analysis that is by now quite old. I mean, I published in 2006. So, and and uh, of course the Irish case is, um, is is very interesting. But um, I'm actually focusing also on the German case and the British case because you know all the the, the post. Uh, Second World War legislation on, on British citizenship is very interesting with, for um, uh, trying to understand the connections between citizenship, nationality laws, and uh, alternative ways of colonizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, if I uh, may, uh, for, for just a second, play the devil's advocate, it seems that uh, many people are unhappy with uh, the inclusion of second, third generation Italians abroad in that, uh, the Italian polity, um, at, at least politically. Um, could an argument perhaps be made in terms of intergenerational justice? Um, after all, we generally think of uh, these people uh, leaving around 1900 as voting with their feet, responding to uh, elite policies that made uh, their, their existence economically untenable. Um, so I guess the question then is, if you know, it generally is a bad idea to disenfranchise people, how would you fix the enfranchisement, that is, the mechanisms through which you turn this population into having something to say uh, politically in Italy, because after all, I mean, when this law was passed, the alternative was have these people vote in a conscription, you know, in a constituency in Italy, and that was clearly turned down because of considerations of uh, partisan balance within Italy. So, a lot of people seem to want to include these uh, second, third generation Italians in some kind of definition of the polity, but how? They could have, um, if they wanted to, have a good, uh, fair law, also constitutionally con more consistent. Uh, they should have given the immigrants, who were Italian citizens, the right to vote abroad, as the Americans do, and many other citizens do, to make uh, their effort to go to vote not difficult. By the way, remember that until a few years ago, I think a few years ago, very few, uh, our constitution was changed where it says, or it said, that the right to vote is a duty. Now we had a Republican conception of the right to vote, the duty to vote. Now we, we, we don't have any more that one. This is complete, it's a completely liberal interpretation now, which means that we are not forced to go to vote, and thus there is no reason for us to uh, be concerned with the losing anything. We don't lose anything if you don't go to vote. So why don't we have the chance to make, should have given us the chance to make it better, easier for us to vote? So that was not a choice related to a right. That was a political choice related to a calculus. Mm -hmm. Not for fairness, but for political reasons. Um, I think intergenerational, we can discuss forever about that. I mean, whether we want to make justice for the injustice that we make against them when they, we send them practically during the Joliti government, they used to even to pay uh, a, the trip to go away without uh, the coming back, the trip. So um, that was an injustice, we know that. But we can, then we have to open the door about uh, justice, uh, re uh, uh, retrospective justice or, or whatever, is another story. You, you don't give, uh, you don't make justice by giving a right to vote. You do other, uh, you intervene in other ways, but not with the right to vote, at least 
uh, it, well, we have we can discuss it with we can discuss. Can I just address one one yeah. uh, one thing on this? Um, we can. Okay, that that is the redress argument, right? So you can call it um, um, sort of a reward for the hardships that the emigrants had to suffer because they were those who left. Um, but I I'm completely agree with Nadia. You you don't you don't give political rights on this uh, on this uh, basis, and uh, but this law is doing exactly this, mm -hmm. is giving political rights on the basis of a redress argument. Mm -hmm. This is the point, because it's giving political rights to the descendants, but it's making very difficult for, the, for those who live today to participate in the, in the, in the election. So I would propose a, a, a reform of the law that is not going to um, affect the rights of anybody on the base on the basis of the generational uh, argument. That is, in two steps. First, um, make people register periodically as electors abroad. Instead of having this coincidence between being listed in the IRA and being an elector. That's the main problem. So if you make people register actively as electors, after all, you can justify that normatively. You are not living in the country. There are some limits of the sovereignty of the state, you know, that they can reach you where you are. So you have to be a little bit more proactive if you want to participate in the political life of your country back home. This is the, the one point. I forgot the second, but there's an urgent question there. Oh, I, I, I just, well, I wanted to speak to what that gentleman just raised. Um, of all of the immigrant groups that at least were in New York, and that you know New York was sort of a locus of immigration in that great second wave from 1880 to the 1920s, uh, Italians were uh, known for going back and forth and back and forth during that period. So if uh, if, if it was really all about oh my God, you know I can't stay in Italy because I'm so oppressed in Italy. Well, you know, you make a little money in America, you go back, and then you come back again to America. There was a big, uh, a big movement in that respect. Now, I, I had a, just a few questions of clarification for you. Um, citizenship is not simply about rights, you know, the big one being voting, but also obligations. obligations. Yeah. And I'm a little bit confused about how uh, uh, much obligation uh, Italians abroad, such as yourselves, have. Are you allowed, for example, to take out dual citizenship, dual residency? Do you have to pay taxes in both places? It depends and, on bilateral agreement. And is there a conscription in Italy? No, 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 no longer. Sorry? So no longer conscription. So we became more liberal. Yeah. For this reason, it's more easier, no? And before there were there were more duties, so it's, it was more difficult to deal with the, all these obligations. Now the citizenship is very liberally based, and for this reason you should ask in the name of that to link more to residents at this point than to taxation. Precisely because this was John Locke, uh, the, the factor of liberalism. I mean, if you don't pay taxes, right? So you don't have interest inside. That it's uh, the, the argument that uh, you can make. Uh, yes, it's really good point. The good point. If an American is trying yeah. to figure yeah. out whether their ancestor who okay. immigrated America from Italy ever renounced his Italian citizenship. If he became, if the ancestor became a naturalized U.S. citizen, I believe the American government considered they, he could be a dual citizen. But back years ago, Italy considered they could not be a dual citizen. So, how do does does Italy today consider that obtaining the ancestor obtaining U.S. citizenship meant that he renounced? No. This is the 1912 law. Um, article 7 was the article that um, um, addressed the question of Italians born abroad. I mean, descendants of Italian immigrants born abroad. <coughs> and it states that unless there are bilateral agreements between Italy and that specific country, 
the children of Italians uh, abroad is considered an Italian at birth immediately. And uh, then it was added, he or she may renounce Italian nationality when he or she comes of age. That was, there was a lengthy debate about this little verb may, or the alternative that was uh, in the bill before the, uh, the bill was passed, that was must. Mm -hmm. That makes a huge difference. And the difference was, and the, uh, the choice was to go with may because of the you know, functional uh, strategy that Italian politicians see. So, back then, in citizenship legislation, that is maintaining the uh, this citizenship at a latent state uh, unilaterally, without you know the other states, uh, without the other states uh, knowing that it was basically that. So, unless there were and in some uh, moments of time there were some bilateral agreements between Italy and other states. Were, by which the, the other state was obliged to communicate to Italian authorities if one Italian citizen was, you know, naturalizing. Um, but unless that occurred, it was, um, you know, uh, for as much as the Italian state was concerned, as far as the Italian state was concerned, there were Italian citizens. Time for one last question. Yes. No, oh. no I. Um, um, I agree that there is a big issue with that uh, law uh, already of 1912 that you connected also to the, uh, uh, this emigration uh, uh, colonialism. But uh, it seems to me that the, the big scandal and really what uh, points out uh, the, super, the racial subtext of all is the 1992 law, which, which is even more uh, exclusive than the 1912 law, right, as, as I understand. Yeah. And it's an act, if you actually read the debates in Parliament, it's, a, 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 it's a really an act of uh, a bad faith, uh, because uh, there's a whole uh, um, rhetoric of voluntarism, of letting people decide what they want to do. But what they actually do is to make things much worse uh, for the um, immigrants from uh, other uh, non-European countries. I mean, that's really what goes on with an incredible, again, uh, I think, bad faith. Uh, I don't know if you agree with this. Uh, yes, the definitely. Of the, the, the 1912 law, for example, the residence requirement for the 1912 law for a foreigner to naturalize, to apply for naturalization, the, the procedure was discretionary. Right. But then again, even today, the procedure is discretionary. It was five years. And now it's 10, so it doubled. Um, the, even the use solid provision in the 1912 law was uh, less restrictive than, than this one. I mean, more restricting than this one, I think it's almost impossible. Um, it was, yeah, it was, yeah. And um, in, the, in the 1990s, scholars uh, working on citizenship uh, spoke about this. Um, Liberalizing or liberalizing turn in citizenship laws, especially in Western uh, democracies, and there was this. Um, the, the, the talk was, well, <coughs> finally Western democracies are opening up uh, to 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 immigrants, etc. Then there were there was uh, September 11, the um, bombing in Madrid and uh, London, 2004-2007. So. Scholars say that now, in, from the mid 2000s on, we are now assisting uh, uh, to a uh, restrictive term in citizenship law and in immigration law. Italy did not participate in the liberalizing term of the 1990s because that reform was exactly going uh, against the, 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 the trend of opening up citizenship to the immigrants but did participate in the restrictive tour, turn of the second half of the 2000s with the security package uh, law that was approved in 2009, which, if anything, worsened uh, even more the, uh, the conditions of the, uh, of the immigrants, their the, the, the rights, actually, and their access to that. Um, I think we're out of time, so please uh, join me in thanking Professor Stintori and Rubina.